make sure that you put some mobile phones on top of it. Mr. Cullen. Uh, my lady, <clears throat> I'm uh, going to address the court now about the detailed provisions of Schedule 2 and one or two parts that we may embody as we do that. To point out those areas where, in our submission, it is clear from the way in which the agreement is drafted and structured that return means uh, effectively receipt or delivery not the consignment <coughs> um, Now, uh, the first point is uh, that we have seen that the delivery procedure in Schedule 2 is full of deadlines. Uh, all of them are, uh, if I can put it this way, receipt-based. Um, now, to uh, show that, perhaps if one starts in the main body of the agreement, uh, first of all, just for a small point, clause 9.1, uh, just to see that the, this is page 262, just to see that the agreement, capital A, includes schedules, uh, and that uh, means includes the <coughs> delivery procedure. And so when one then turns forward to 10.9, one sees that notices of communications to be given or made under this agreement shall be uh, made by letter or email and shall be deemed to be duly given or made when. Uh, so that applies to the schedule as well, which is 9.1. And one can see there that when notices or communications have to be given or made, they are treated or deemed as being given or made upon receipt. So in relation to A, where it's a personal service, as it were, uh, when they are delivered. In the case of email, it's when they are received. And in the case of pre, pre first class postage prepaid, uh, it is when received, and there is a deeming provision as to when that receipt should be. So uh, that is uh, part of the background. One then turns to the delivery procedure itself. <coughs> and as I have said, there are various things parties have to do at various points, and they all uh, take effect upon receipt. Uh, just a couple of examples. Uh, paragraph 1.1 on page 276. Uh, under this, uh, the sales agent shall have 30 days from receipt of its written notice, uh, from the, uh, say the delivery notice, to, and, and then if one reads down to the penultimate line, to notify in writing that, etc., etc. Now, clearly, that notification takes effect upon receipt. Uh, and one can see that um, from the fact that, uh, from, I'm sorry, one can see that from clause 10.9 itself, because that's what it provides. Now, in this context, it's also relevant to look at paragraph 10 in the schedule, page 280, which deals with notices under Schedule 2 specifically. And it provides that notices must be by email. Um, so therefore, if one looks back at 10.9, it's prescribing that for the purpose of the schedule, you have to take option A and further provides that they are deemed received when sent, generally, that is because obviously transmission of emails is almost instantaneous, but not, not if the email is sent uh, outside of office hours, in which case they're deemed received on the following business day. All of that shows that one is dealing with uh, receipts as being the key point, so that when uh, one looks at the requirement to give the notification under 1.1. One sees 
that by virtue of paragraph 10, the notification must be by email, and it will take effect when received, and if that's outside of office hours, it'll be the following business day. And then uh, if one, uh, one can also see uh, at paragraph 1.1 uh, that, it, that it is made all the more clear in the words in the third line uh, that the time starts to run from and after receipt of the written notice. Uh, now that is a thread that runs throughout this uh, in relation to all steps which have to be taken except, according to my learned friend, in relation to return. And he says that that, in, a, in, a, in, in a, a fantastic piece of acrobatics, he says, ah, well, because they used a different word, return, the draftsman must be taken to have meant something entirely different in that one instance. Every other case where one notifies, where one makes requests, where one uh, delivers, that's all receipt-based. But because the draftsman used the word return, uh, that must be taken in that one instance, to connote sending. Um, we say that is uh, fantastical in the extreme and ascribes a, a subtlety of mind to the draftsman, which is wholly unrealistic. And the obvious uh, starting point or inference would be that the same should apply in relation to return as applies in relation to all the other acts that are required of delivery, of notification, of making requests, that they take effect upon receipt. And then, um, if one looks specifically at the uses of the uh, word receipt, uh, that is only uh, emphasized. Uh, to take a few of them, uh, and this really follows on from the uh, uh, point I've just made, return is used in various contexts alongside other actions. Uh, so, and this is an example the judge referred to, uh, paragraph 6.1 on page 279. And what one has at the bottom of paragraph 6.1 is the provision um, that the additional cure notice must be given in no event later than 15 business days after the later of, one, receiving the additional objection notice, uh, or two, return of the notice delivery materials as appropriate requested. Uh, the judge took the view, and we say quite correctly, that it would be peculiar if the first were receipt-based, but the second were based on an act of sending or consignment or something else. Uh, we say that the fact that uh, those two limbs are used in conjunction, the natural uh, conclusion to draw from that is that that should be the same, i.e. receipt-based. Um, and in parentheses, this again takes one back to paragraph 10, because this is the point at which my learned friend suggests in a slightly Alice in Wonderland submission uh, in his uh, written argument, at least. I'm not sure if he pressed the um, that paragraph 10 should be regarded as a sending-based provision uh, when it is clear uh, that it is dealing with emails being treated as received, and that is what is important, and they are just received when sent because it's instantaneous, uh, but there is the provision that they are deemed received later if sent outside of office hours. One sees the same uh, conjunction of return with other acts in other clauses. They're all to the same effect. Uh, so, for example, uh, clause paragraph 2. Uh, there here are uh, three relevant acts. If the sales agent fails to give an acceptance notice, that is going to be receipt-based by virtue of clause 
10.9. Or if the sales agent fails to return, we say that is receipt based. And then three, if after giving an objection notice and having after having received a request, therefore, fails to provide within the time period of response. That again is going to be receipt based. So there one has the first and the third on any view becoming uh, the, the critical time being when they are received. Uh, we say it would be very peculiar indeed if the second one did not proceed on the same basis. Whilst we're in paragraph two, to make a further point, one then looks down at what is to be done in the events described, one sees that uh, what happens is there is a deemed acceptance notice given. Sorry, where are you? Well, I'm in clause paragraph two on page 277. Yeah. There is a deemed acceptance notice given. Uh, now, uh, pausing there on the uh, on my learned friend's uh, version of events, the guarantor won't know whether that's happened or not, because he won't know whether the goods have been sent or not. So I'll come back to that. Uh, and then it provides that EFB or the guarantor shall thereupon give notice of uh, the deemed acceptance notice. But because on my learned friend's scenario, the guarantor won't know whether there has been a failure to return, because he won't know on what date the return took place, he won't be able to give the notice that he is required thereupon to give. That, we say, is a strong indicator that a return must be receipt-based, as limbs one and three of paragraph two are, because the uh, guarantor or EFB or the producer needs to know whether the goods have been returned, not just for the general reason that he needs to know whether there's been deemed acceptance, but also because he is an under, under an obligation then thereupon to give <coughs> notice. Um, clause 3.1 one sees a similar conjunction. This is really the same as 6.1. At the bottom, one has 30 days after the later of receiving objection notice or the return. Again, that conjunction, we say, is consistent and only really consistent with them both being receipt-based. And uh, paragraph 9 is really the counterpart of paragraph two that we've just looked at. It's the round two uh, equivalent, and it is to the same effect. That is to say, there are various contingencies, uh, in this case only two, in contrast to paragraph two. Uh, the first one is clearly receipt-based, we say, by parity of reasoning, the second one must also be, and clause 9, paragraph 9, also imposes the obligation thereupon to give notice to the beneficiaries in circumstances where the guarantor will only be able to do that when he knows that the deadline has been missed. And he will only know that if the deadline is for the material to be delivered into his hand. Uh, then, uh, my lady, my lord, if one looks at... Um, uh, Mr Cullen, is there um, any relevance in the phrase in the third line of paragraph 9 of its return to EFB or the guarantor, the materials, within the time period specified in 5.2? Now, does, does that make any difference to one's understanding of return that in this case? There's a within a, a phrase which says within a particular period. Well, 
there, there is a fr that's really picking up 5.2. Yes. Where the same phrase is in effect mm. used. Now, I say this is all of a piece with my argument. Yes. My learned friend will accuse me of circular reasoning. Uh, yeah. But uh, one has to break the circle at some point. And uh, we say that these are all indicators of an agreement that has a constant thread of uh, receipt-based deadlines, if you like. And uh, moreover, that only works if it's receipt-based. The, the, the passage I've referred to, the thereupon giving notice, we say is one instance of why it only works if it's receipt-based. Uh, I'll come on to others in due course. Um, so so the, the, um, forgive me if I'm being a bit slow, but this picks up uh, in 5.2 at page 278, penultimate line, the sales agent shall return those Lotus delivery materials to EFB or the guarantor. Yes. Yeah. yes. It's exactly. the same point. It's the same point. And the, fact so, and, and the same language. Yes. Uh, the, the fact that it is indicating that they must be returned to, we say simply reinforces the natural meaning of the word, that when you return something, you have to return it to yeah. the person. You don't just send it. Putting it in the post is not returning it to the person. Um, then one has the point that what starts this bit of the process going at all is that there must be a request for return of the material. And we say a written request for return means what it says. That is to say that they be delivered into my hand, not just put in the post. And then uh, one has, this is taking it in round one, in paragraph 1.1.2, at the top of 277, that the return is for what purpose? It is in order to allow the producer or EFB or the guarantor to cure the defects in such Lotus delivery material. Now, those, we say, are very important words. I'll come in due course to the supposed evidential spat about what is required for affecting uh, cures. One doesn't really need to look at that evidence which I'll develop later because this tells you what the purpose is. The purpose is to enable the defects or sorry, to, an, to allow the producer or EFB or the guarantor to cure the defect in such delivery, lotus delivery material, i.e. the lotus delivery materials that have been returned. And that purpose, that objective cannot be achieved without the materials being in the producer or EFB or the guarantor's hand. We say that is an extremely... I think it would technically be correct that even if they reconstituted a set, an, a, a duplicate set or another set, it wouldn't be such materials because it wouldn't be the, su the materials that were requested to be returned. No, it wouldn't. The reason why uh, th this idea that you could reconstitute is, is um, an invention by counsel with respect. But in any event, if one looks at the terms of the document, one can see what the parties intended. And the parties intended that the materials would be returned in order to allow the defect to be cured. And it's perhaps important to note, or relevant, that this the whole point of this return is for the specific purpose of curing technical defects. So there are various objections that can be made, i.e. they could be made that, there was, that not all the materials were delivered, or that they didn't comply with the approved picture specification. And my learned friend gives you the example of not all the scripts being represented in the film. Is that right or not? I take that as a hypothetical example. That'll be an instance of not 
complying with the approved picture specification. That's not the purpose of the return. The return is only, or the request for return only arises where the sales agent contends that some or all of the materials are not of technical quality and suitable for the making of commercially acceptable release prints. And I'm reading that from the bottom of page 276. So the return is for a specific purpose to address cures to one of the heads of objection that can be made. And the agreement goes on to tell you what the purpose is to allow the producer to cure the defect. The producer or the EFB or whoever it may be will of course not be able to do that if the goods are in transit. It can only do that once the goods or the materials are in its hands. We say that is a very powerful indicator that what return means is a return sufficient to allow the producer or EFB or guarantor to do what the return is intended to allow it to do. Now, then, and just for completeness, one has precisely the same wording and provisions we've looked at in 1.1.2. Apart from a different time limit, the same arises under 5.2 in round two of the process, which is the one that obviously gave rise to the failure in this regard. I don't think anything in particular turns on that. But the same wording arises, and what is obviously critical is that the, and intended, is that the guarantor or EFB or the producer will have the material. I'm going to return to this point in a few moments to deal with what may be described as the two implied term points, although there are now no implied terms in guarantee, but we'll come to that. But to launch into that, what one needs to understand, and the court will have this, and this is crucial because this is nothing to do with circularity. This has got to do with how the agreement can work in practice on the rival contention. Return, as we see, plays an absolutely key role in the whole process. It operates as the starting point for the cure period and the additional cure period under clauses 3.1 and 6.1. So one sees in 3.1 that the sales agent, sorry, if the sales agent gives an objection notice, then EFB or the guarantor shall either, and the first one is give a cure notice, and that cure notice must be given in no event later than 30 days after the later of receiving the objection notice or the return of the material that the guarantor has requested be returned in order to cure any claimed defect. Again, one has the purpose spelt out there. That's the cure period. So return starts the cure period, and the same one sees at round two in 6.1. Now, it is critical, it goes without saying, for the guarantor to know when the cure period starts because only then can it know when it has to serve its cure notice by, and it will only know when the cure period starts if the cure period starts when it receives the materials that have been returned. If return means what my learned friend says, then the guarantor or EFB will not know when the cure period starts. That is a proposition which is frankly absurd, given the structure of the agreement and the importance of it. And my learned friend seems frankly to accept that. 
and we'll come to his supposed answer in a few minutes. Uh, below it was said that, well, there would be an implied term that they would tell us when they sent the money. Um, uh, but that's not pursued um, and, and raises the question of its own as to what that implied term would be and what would happen in the event of its breach, uh, which in this case it was breached. Um, now it's said that, ah, well, what the guarantor has to do is to assume that the materials were sent on the same day he sent his request to us, and to work on that basis, thereby suffering a reduction in the cure period and the additional cure period. A reduction which may or may not, in fact, be warranted because the delivery materials may or may not, in fact, have been sent on the same day that the request was sent. So the guarantor might be done out of a few days of a quite short cure period unnecessarily because, in fact, it turns out that the materials were not sent, as my learned friend would have it, until the end of the relevant period lab. So out of an abundance of caution, in every case, every time this happens, the guarantor has to proceed on the basis that he has a shorter cure period than the agreement actually provides. And that on the facts, even on my learned friend's interpretation, he might have, because perhaps the goods won't be sent until the end of the period. Um, that is a proposition which is frankly risible. The parties cannot possibly have intended that the contract should work in that way. My learned friend at one stage suggested, well, we could ask. Well, it's, you've got to, it's being phrased as an obligation. It, it's almost being it's being said that although the term provides for a cure period of twelve days, the respondent must assume that he's only got nine. It's uh, fifteen, twelve, but uh, but, but it, yeah, 15, that's, but that, that's the way it was put. Yeah. Um, and so so the, in effect, at the moment, I'm not entirely clear where this obligation comes from. But no, I, I think it's just a practical obligation because the guarantor cannot take the risk. Well, in that which case, being co having contracted for one period, it's being said that for no reason it should operate on the basis of another one. Exactly. Yeah. Out of an abundance of caution. Although it might turn out, after the, after the fact, when one comes to investigate it, they didn't, in fact, put the materials in the post till the end of the period. Because we won't know that. And, and, and I'll come back to that point, because then you come to what... what, what called my erosion argument. Um, because you won't know that, you have to assume they've been sent at the first day, the first possible stage. So with that being too unkind, you, you would say he's on a, whatever you, whatever they described, Morton's Fork or whatever, which either he's got to have the implied term which he breached anyway, <coughs> or he's got to, you've got to, you've got to assume that the term isn't what it says in the contract. Disavowed in effect. So he's, he's left with just this, this idea that although the contract says I have 15 years, I have to assume that time only starts to, that time has already started to run more or less when I send my request. Although in fact, he may wait for three days before he puts it in the post. And if he puts it in the post, and this um, I'll develop this in due course in my erosion argument. I've not just lost the three days. If he then puts it in the post and uses a three-day delivery, I then don't get it until six days into my cure period, as I believe my cure period to be, or as I've got to assume my cure period to be. So 
So I've got a 15 day cure period, and on that actual scenario, I've lost six days. Um, uh, I don't, I don't, this simply cannot possibly work in that, and it certainly cannot be what the party intended. Um, there was some suggestion, as I said, uh, that, that we could ask, and, and the, the question came from more than one voice at the bench why? Um, and, and the other uh, which I basically adopt uh, the other point would be if we ask they may say not telling why <laughs> should they tell us there's no requirement on them to tell us there's no implied term no. so um, that is frankly uh, an insoluble problem on my learned friend's uh, interpretation but it gets worse uh, and this is the second implied term point, which uh, I listened to my learned friend and I don't think he really addressed at all. I think uh, he's abandoned all of uh, all the implied terms. He's abandoned the implied terms, but the he's mistake. left with the problem, which, which required the implied term in the court below. Now he doesn't want, he's not pushing that, but he's left with the problem, which he hasn't addressed, which is this, that uh, the cure period starts with... Uh, return, as I've said. And so if the cure period starts uh, when the goods are sent, then every day they spend in transit, the guarantor's ability to cure defects is eroded. And it's eroded by however long consignment happens to take. And that's open-ended. And we know that the agreement doesn't specify any mode of consignment. That in itself is an extremely surprising proposition, that one should have a position where the cure period, which we know from the agreement is intended to enable us to affect cures to the delivered material, if the length of that because it begins to run before we've actually got the material, is entirely contingent upon what mode of delivery is chosen. So, to take an extreme example, I can't see any reason under the contract why the sales agent couldn't send it across the Atlantic. In that case, on my learned friend's uh, construction... Which I don't think there are any. QE2, then, I think, would run. Uh, on, on my learned friends, no, the Justice Department is shaking his head. Anyway, I think the QE2 is in Dubai as a hotel or something. <laughs> my, my, my knowledge of um, I think that's right. transatlantic liners is It's all right, it's just something that was on the television. <laughs> There's, no need to to point. There's no mode of delivery prescribed. Yeah. So any mode of delivery could be chosen, and a mode of delivery could be chosen which meant that the materials didn't actually arrive in Soho in London uh, until after the cure period had expired. Um, that is uh, preposterous. Um, in the court below, as I said, the suggestion was, well, there'll be an implied term as to the mode of delivery. Um, uh, various versions were put forward and the judge sets them out in his judgment. None of them is entirely clear completely obscure as to what would be the effect of a breach of them. I mean, are these, is, is this implied term to be as a, a precondition so that if you don't affect delivery in accordance with this notional implied term, there hasn't been return? Or, or is it just is it just sound in damages? Who knows? But anyway, it's not pursued that. So one is left with the problem and no solution to it. Now, um, I will come back to what my learned friend does say factually about this I I in a moment, but I just want to make one other point. That the, the discussion that was had in relation to these problems, and in particular in relation to the three-day period and the idea that we should assume that the goods or the materials were returned on the same day we made the request. Of course, this must also apply to round one, where the... Um, 
the periods are that much longer. And the proposition that we should assume uh, sending on the day that we made the request becomes even more difficult to swallow. So at page 276, at the bottom, um, the period here is five business days. The, uh, the sales agent has five business days from receipt of the request. to effect the return. And so on my learned friend's scenario, we would have to, five business days, so that's in practice seven days, assuming no bank holiday, uh, we would have to assume a return of the goods uh, seven days before they might possibly that's the length of time that uh, the sales agent has to do the act. And then, of course, one has the further period for the goods actually to arrive, the materials actually to arrive. And on our side of the fence, during all of this period, during these five business days, or seven actual days, more if they're a bank holiday, we've got to assume that the materials which we're supposed to be working on to cure defects, we're supposed to assume that they have actually already been returned all that time ago. And so uh, that is uh, absurd in itself and has the knock-on effect on the first cure period because all of that will be lost time for us to affect the And the other effect of all of this, of course, is that one has the peculiar result. I noted uh, this morning the, the symmetry between the, the 30 days and the 30 days, and the 15 business days and the 15 business days. On this scenario, um, if my learned friend is right, uh, they get 30 days to identify defects, and we get 30 days minus the seven days that we've got to assume they're in the post to us. And then minus whatever time it actually takes for the materials to get to us, depending upon <coughs> what mode of delivery is in fact chosen. We lose all of that period to affect our cure. One might have thought that one would have a shorter period to identify the the, the problems, and then a longer period to cure them. One doesn't know. What the parties opted for is equal on both sides. What my learned friend is contending for is by far letting be a period to identify the problems than we then get to cure them in practice. Um, we say that cannot possibly be right. Um, and indeed, as I've said, by choosing a suitably slow mode of delivery for the return, we could lose any ability to cure at all. Uh, there's a further point arising from all of this, which, which is, in a sense, a more fundamental one, and I think it's one which the bench book picked up earlier, um, which is that my own friend talks about return meaning send. And in doing so, what he is assuming is an act of consignment which the agreement simply doesn't provide for. So it's assuming that there is an act, there is a point at which one can identify when the materials have been sent, and that starts the clock running. And in this case, we know they were consigned to FedEx, and one might say, well, you could just sort of see that that's what they were consigned to. But the agreement doesn't provide that they have to be uh, delivered by FedEx or anything. They could. Uh, and indeed, the safest way to deliver them might be for an employee to take them on a plane from LA to London and hand deliver them. And in that scenario, at what point are they sent? And various examples were debated. Is it, is it when 
director leaves home. And there's no satisfactory answer to that, because it's entirely artificial. The talk is then being sent in such circumstances. What if the managing director sets off from his home in Los Angeles with them in his bag and goes via Paris to do a couple of days' business on his way to London? Were they sent when he left LA? Who knows? It's artificial, it doesn't work because the contract doesn't make provision. The contract doesn't make provision for it because the contract works on the basis that return means deliver. And so it doesn't need to concern itself with at what point the materials might be considered to be sent. And that is why the contract also doesn't need to concern itself with the ways in which the materials might be delivered. None of that matters on our interpretation and on the judge's interpretation because it's clear. One has the certainty one needs. Goods are returned when they are in the hands of the person to whom they are to be returned. Now, uh, my lords, my lady, against that background, we say that the provisions of the agreement are entirely clear, and the rival contention put forward by the appellants is just a nonsense and simply cannot work, both because one doesn't know the start point of the cure period, and the cure period is potentially eroded, possibly lost entirely, by a choice taken by the uh, appellants as to how the goods be delivered. Now, in answer to all of this, uh, my learned friend points to some evidence about whether the good materials needed to be delivered for return to be effective. A look at that in due course. We say that's completely irrelevant because the agreement itself tells you what the purpose is for the return of the materials. It is to allow them. Uh, to allow the producer or EFB or the guarantor to cure the defect. And so for us to have a debate about what various witnesses say might or might not be necessary is completely by the by. You find the answer in the agreement. Uh, the second point is this. I think my learned friend, it wasn't quite clear, but I think where we got to in the end is he, he accepts that delivery of the materials might, there will be circumstances where we, delivery of the materials will be necessary before one can begin to effect a cure. If that's right, then the fact that one might have instances where the materials don't need to be returned is really nothing to the point, because as my Lord Justice Chapman said, uh, the agreement's got to cater for all possibilities. Uh, in any event, the evidence is clear that one needs the materials to be returned before one can effect a cure, or indeed before one can see where one can, where one needs to effect a cure. Uh, just to, to back up a bit, the, the delivery materials will be all that the sales agent has. So one has the masters back in London. The delivery materials are where the defects are identified. The delivery, the objection notice won't be identifying defects in the, in the masters. It will only be identifying defects in the materials that have been originally delivered. <coughs> Those, therefore, when to, to assess the objection notice in relation to those materials, and particularly in relation to the technical defects, which is what the return is targeted one inevitably needs to see those delivery materials to see whether the defects exist and to see what action needs to be taken. It is described in evidence by two uh, witnesses. Um, there is first of all the passage uh, of Mr. Owens, uh, which my learned friend showed you. Uh, behind tab 13, and it is, I think, paragraph 56. 
6.3, I think that's the one we particularly uh, referred to. Um, Mr. Owens, to his credit, is a uh, litigation solicitor. Um, he is not, I think, involved in post-production. Uh, he doesn't give any source for the evidence he gives, uh, and one simply doesn't know what experiences facing any of this are. Um, but at all events, he says, uh, the materials returned by Lotus would not have needed to have been amended in any way from those, sorry, would not have been amended in any way from those provided to it by EFB. Well, perhaps. Uh, EFB would review the objection notice and would make or and or commission any revisions to the materials it considered necessary by accessing the master copy. Well, that may partly describe the process, but what that doesn't do is cover what Mr. Harrow describes in his witness statement, he being someone who's worked in post-production for more than 40 years. And Mr. Howe took you to this this morning, and in particular, it's paragraphs 8 to 13 on page 243. And he describes a process essentially whereby masters, you, what one has the masters, various elements of the masters are compiled to make delivery materials, which are then delivered. And errors can occur in the compiling process. So there will be errors which won't be on the delivery material, sorry, on the masters at all. They will only be on the delivery material. Or there may be some errors which are uh, which originate with the masters. And what the production post-production house need is to see the delivery materials, to see whether the defects are in those and are a function of the compiling process or whether they are in the masters. It is true, as Mr. Owen said, that uh, the guarantor will have the objection notice. But the objection notice will only tell him of the defects that are in the delivered material. It won't tell him whether there are defects, whether those are defects that derive from the compiling process or from the masters. So it's quite wrong to suggest that these sorts of technical issues can be cured immediately by looking at the masters with the help of an objection notice. The objection notice identifying defects on a set, completely different set of things, i.e. the compiled delivery material. One has to get the objection notice with the delivery material and then see where the problem is. And that's what Mr. Harrow describes. <coughs> and that is why the agreement provides for return of the <coughs> If what was intended was that the guarantor should simply make changes to the masters and run off a new set of delivery materials, there would be no need for return in the first place. It wouldn't provide for it. And that answers the suggestion made the last thing Eleanor Friend said before we sat down that one could just run off another set. That's not what this agreement provides for. This agreement provides for delivery materials to be delivered, delivery materials to be returned and cured, and those delivery materials to go back again. And so the suggestion that really it's all unnecessary and no return of the material is inconsistent with the express terms of the agreement and inconsistent with the evidence. But as I said, my lady, my lord, it may not matter much because I don't think my London friend goes so far as to say that was going to be in every case. And he accepts there will be some cases where the re return of the delivery materials will be necessary before any work can be done. Can I see if I've just got this right? You cannot just run off another set as it will not be known whether the alleged defect in the original LDM 
arose from defects in the master or something that arose on compiler. That's, yeah. that's the point. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You 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 have an objection there, and that's that details objections, and they're obviously by reference to the delivered originally delivered material because that's all the file goes to. And you don't know whether those are defects which are derived from the compiling process or from the master. I, I, I'm sure Mr. Harrow would say I'm going to simplify, but that's as I understand it. And also, you can't, you can't, sorry, you can't determine whether there is in fact a defect in the in the original LDM. No. No. I was going to say you might be able to tell uh, by looking at the master and looking at the objection notice if it's uh, it would seem that the defects arise from compilation and therefore are in the uh, copy that was sent. Uh, but that's different from being in a position to cure it. Indeed. Or what one might look at the objection notice and and see, uh, and then I suppose you could look at the master and, again. and you could say, well, it's, 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 it's objecting to this, but it looks fine to me. And that might be because the problem is in the delivered material, the compilation. But it might be because people just have an honest difference of view as to what's commercially acceptable quality. One doesn't know. But the post-production house can't roll their sleeves up and get to grips with any of this until they've got the delivered material back to carry out the exercise to assess whether the, whether the, whether the objection has any substance and whether it's an objection in compilation to, to something that's happened in compilation or, or, or it's a defect in the master. Uh, so, the part is provided for return because it was necessary. And for my learned friend to suggest otherwise is, is uh, runs in the face of not only what the agreement says, but also the evidence. Um, now, uh, this, is, this is a small point, but just for completeness. My learned friend made a point by reference to the notice of charge. Uh, and the suggestion being, I think, that uh, the guarantor had control. These are the documents at um, page 314 and 315. Uh, and then there's an acknowledgement of the notice of charge. Uh, and I think the suggestion being, certainly if you read the skeleton argument, the suggestion is that this gave control and rights of access to the guarantor, to the master. I don't think it takes the argument further, but for what it's worth, uh, I just note that uh, what this provides is that all the rights, to the extent that the guarantor has any rights, they're all secondary to the rights of the senior secured party, who is uh, an owner friend's client, Larkhark. Uh, Larkhark was the senior uh, lender, and so, for example, when my learned friend refers to uh, uh, authorization to uh, permit materials including the DCP to be removed or copied without the prior approval of the senior secured party. Just to be clear, that senior secured party is not my client, it's, it's Larkark. So Larkark had control over the masters ultimately. Um, uh, but I, I don't think in any event that point is going to advance matters much for the court anyway. Uh, so what it comes back to, uh, my lady and my lords, is uh, yes, uh, the sales agent took the risk, took the risk, assumed the contractual risk of being able to return the goods in the time uh, set out under the agreement. Uh, one can assume that it did so with its eyes open, and it did so in circumstances where delivery within that time frame is perfectly possible. Contracts assign risks, uh, and that is to be expected. It is a risk of a similar kind to that which my client took in relation to delivery of the materials, uh, failure of which, as I've explained, would have resulted in it <coughs> having to go to uh, an arbitration, which, if there was a foundation in the objection notice, it would have lost. So there was parity to that extent. The important point in considering that assignment of risk is that the person who is best able to mitigate the risk is the person who's got to affect delivery. 
because it can choose how to affect the rubbish. It can decide, yes, I'll put the managing director on a plane tomorrow. I'm not going to entrust this to her. Uh, it can do any number of things. It may be able to insure for its own safety. But the mode of delivery was in the control of the sales agent, and therefore it's entirely to be expected that it should take the risk of any problem with that delivery being affected within the time required. One also perhaps should step back from this slightly. This is an insurance contract in relation to one aspect of a film production. Um, we've talked about what parties stood to gain or lose. Uh, at the end of the day, they, the film was a film was delivered. Now, there may be a dispute about whether it was of acceptable quality, and it may be that the result of this case is that in the events that have happened, uh, Larkark has lost the opportunity to arbitrate over whether it's entitled to that sum. But it didn't get into this to make an insurance claim. It got into this to make a film. It's got a film. And one can't lose sight of that fact. My learned friend says it's been in post-production all this time. We don't know quite what's been happening with it. We haven't had control of it. But they've not lost out entirely on what they embarked on this for. They have a film which they can exploit if they want to. If they've lost the rights under this guarantee, uh, that is because they undertook certain contractual risks. And we know what's happened. It was well in their control to avoid it. only themselves to blame. But anyway, uh, this isn't a, a, a matter of what's there on the record. It's a matter of what the contract says. The contract only works if it says what Learned Friend today says it says. So I guess that's a helpful point to end on. Thank you. No, thank you very much, Mr. Cohen. Mr. Howe, have you got a reply? Uh, yes, I have some points in reply, which I will take in order of appearance and endeavour to avoid repeating things that I've said before. Yes, uh, first of all, my learned friend referred to some of the evidence, I think Mr. Jolson's witness statement, about what FedEx says it can do regarding its normal business services, which part of the evidence below. Uh, the point about that, um, my lady and my lords, is that that is a description of an ideal world or ideal circumstances, which doesn't take the matter any further for present purposes, regardless of the fact that if everything is working properly, you can get a package from Los Angeles to London in 24 hours, whatever the case may be. Uh, there still remains foreseeable to reasonable commercial parties at the time they made this agreement a significant risk that through no fault of either party such a transmission might be delayed so as to fall outside the three-day period. And uh, this does not involve the positing of extraordinary or unlikely or unreasonable events, as my learned friend sought to suggest. There are many things such as customs delays, such as um, uh, problems with planes, problems with the weather, problems indeed as we've seen with outbreaks of uh, disease which can cause it substantial interruptions of transport services. So if it works properly it should be fine? If all works properly it so should So what be you're fine. taking the risk of is that the process that you decide to follow doesn't work properly? No, um, mm. Lord, that's not quite the way I put it. Well I know it's not quite the way you put it, but, it, but if, if Mr Cullen is right, the risk that you're accepting is that the mode of transport that you choose doesn't operate properly? Uh, my Lord, it's broader than that. It's foreseeable that the parties could, uh, it's, it was foreseeable to the parties at the time they entered into the contract that there existed significant risks that might make it impossible for the package to be delivered within three days from Los Angeles to London, regardless of what mode it was chosen. Well, what, what do you say, I'm sorry, what do you say are the significant risks? What you're saying is that uh, in, in, a, in a small world, where 
however many planes there are going across every day, and there are 43 different ways of sending it to the 43 different consigners of whom FedEx are one. You're taking the risk that um, the, the, the system will not work. That, that's right, my lord. And it's well, you, you call that significant, but, but why, why do you call it significant? Uh, because, because, my lord, such matters as custom delays, which, for example, affected the second packet that was being sent, may lead to a delay in delivery. That's a commonplace problem. But there are all sorts of other possibilities that might affect, afflict uh, transport over such a large distance, which make a three-day period in our submission uh, an unlikely drop-dead deadline uh, for the loss of all of the rights under the contract. So the starting point is, to, is that the, the evidence that my learned friend referred to is if everything is working perfectly. It's a bit like looking at a train timetable for East Coast railways and saying, look, there are all these trains going up there and you can be sure of getting there by lunch. I, I wouldn't day. accept that for a moment. You can give evidence about the reliability of East Coast railways if you like. No, so I, wasn't, I, may I, wasn't, I was illustrating the point. I was certainly not attempting to give evidence. My, yeah. my, my, my point was simply that uh, simply s looking at the FedEx website and saying uh, this is what they say they can do uh, and uh, this is the number of flights in ordinary circumstances take place every day is, is a description of an, I of an ideal world in which it doesn't take account of what the parties can be taken to have acknowledged which is regardless of what method you might use uh, three days is a tight time period to get a package 100% reliably Why from shouldn't one turn, to one, turn that on one's head and say the parties have agreed to this because they know that in a normal course of events this is not a risk that they should be terrified of, although it exists. Uh, well, my lord, in my submission, the risk is, is, is significant, sufficiently significant, given the consequences of the failure to comply with the three-day deadline for the appellants, that that affects the uh, interpretation of the relevant clause. It's the background in which, one, in which one has to assess the reasonableness of the alternative interpretation. And I think you're making a slightly different point as well, or I understood it slightly differently, perhaps it wasn't, and you made it differently, uh, which was that there may be outside um, eventualities also. And you were talking about uh, um, plane crashes or, or pandemics or, or whatever. But in re with regard to those, um, uh, is, is not the, uh, the bottom of your complaint that in relation to this provision, uh, the force majeure um, provisions do not apply. And that's a different different complaint, is it not? Uh, it isn't a complaint, my lady, that the force majeure provision doesn't apply. It is an observation that it doesn't apply. And that is a factor that one must then bear in mind when approaching the interpretation of an ambiguous clause. Thank you. Uh, it's not a complaint, it doesn't play. What it shows is that there's been, because the force majeure provision doesn't apply, that makes it less likely that the parties would have contemplated that a very tight three-day time limit would lead to the loss of all rights under the contract. That's, that's the way I uh, intended to put it. That's the reason I referred to the force majeure. And the reason it's relevant to notice, because of course there is in fact a force majeure provision in this contract, but it relates mm. to a different delivery period, which is the delivery time period for the time period for the completion and delivery of the film. Yes. And so this, but the parties don't have a similar provision here, and that's why I say one has to approach the interpretation of this clause, bearing in mind that there are these external events that the parties clearly contemplated could happen, uh, uh, and therefore one must decide, given the alternative consequences for each party, where would reasonable commercial parties have placed the balance of risk of these sorts of events? Uh, next, my own friend made some submissions concerning um, the, uh, and related to the same point. Uh, concerning the use of the word, um, uh, alleging or asserting that the consequence was equal for both sides on either interpretation. In other words, it's e was the consequence were equal for each side if they failed to meet whichever deadline it is. In other words, it was three days last and we failed to meet it. That's an equal consequence as it is for uh, EFB and the respondents. Uh, we say that's simply incorrect. 
My own friend suggested that all we lost was the loss of a chance to arbitrate. That's not what we lost at all. We lost the entire right to payment under the contract, whether or not we were right about there being defects in the delivery materials. So it's a complete loss of any entitlement to claim anything under the contract. On the other side, what the respondents lose, even if the whole of their cure period is eaten up, is simply the loss of an opportunity to affect some cures, possibly, depending on the nature of the defects, depending on whether there were defects, and depending on whether they were curable or not. So there is no equivalence in the consequences for either parties on the alternative interpretation. Uh, next, my learned friend referred to the CPRs. He also referred to this in his skeleton uh, as an illustration of the use of the word return to mean to return and receive. Well, that may be so in the CPRs, but it doesn't take us anywhere in my submission uh, because there's no evidence that the parties were aware of the CPRs or the relevant provisions of the CPRs at the time they entered into the contract. It's simply another illustration of what we accept is one use of the word return. Uh, next, my own friend referred to uh, certain of the notice provisions as part of the theme of submissions in which he said that there was a thread running through the schedule and the contract that the events were to be receipt based. Uh, in our submission, that's simply not correct when one looks at the contract and it amounts to a misreading of the relevant clauses. Uh, first of all, in relation to the clause uh, 10.9 in the main contract, which is at page 266 of the bundle. As I noted in my original submissions, in fact, this has three different methods of um, giving notice. One is delivery, the other is receipt, but the third is deemed receipt based only on sending. Uh, under 10C, contrary to what my learned friend submitted, there is no requirement that the post should be received at all. It is simply deemed to have been received when it's put in the post. It's a sending provision. The same is true in relation to the notice clause in the schedule, which is clause 10 at page 280. Now, I've already again mentioned this. Obviously, it relates to email. But nonetheless, it is not a receipt provision. It is a deemed receipt provision based on sending. Because what it provides is that um, in the middle as one sees and shall be deemed received when sent so as long as a party can demonstrate they sent the email even if it isn't actually received for some technical reason at the other end someone fails to turn on their computer or their email program doesn't boot up properly or whatever it may be all the things that uh, can happen in relation to technical matters it is still deemed received so this is again not a receipt based provision it's a sent based provision uh, the other part of it which concerns the deeming of the timing of, uh, of received, uh, that goes, that, the, the, in other words, that when it is received is um, on the following business day, outside the hours, etc. That simply relates to the timing of the deemed receipt. It doesn't change it from being a deeming, a deemed receipt based on sending and not on actual receipt. Again, to take my example, if the email was proved to be sent, it arrived outside office hours will still be deemed to be received when the office is open the next day, regardless of whether it appeared on the screen of the relevant person or not. There was some technical problem at the other end. So it's not the case that this contract is based on uh, receipt-based provisions. Uh, rather, it's the reverse. To the extent that the notice provisions bear on this issue, they demonstrate in relation to the main contract that one of the limbs was based on a postal rule of sending. And in relation to the sending of emails under the schedule itself, they are also based on deemed receipt rather than actual receipt. In other words, they're based on sending, not receipt. Uh, next, in relation to 
the um, question of the timing of the cure period and also correct interpretation of um, clause 5.2 and also, as it happens, clause 6.1, to the extent it relate, the two are related. Uh, first of all, Lord Lord Justice Stuart Smith uh, raised the question of whether I was saying there was an obligation on EF, uh, EFB to um, start to cure the, the materials within, uh, within 15 business days of the request for return. I wasn't suggesting there was an obligation to do that. All I was saying was that there was no reason why EFB could not simply assume that the 15-day period had started to run as soon as they had sent their request for return of the materials. And if they did so, they would be safe if they completed the cure, cure activities within the 15-day period. It might be that, in fact, uh, Lotus had taken three days to put the materials in the post or give them to FedEx, as the case may be, in which case it would turn out they had an extra three days. But there would be nothing to prevent them from proceeding on the assumption for safety that the cure notices of the cure period had started to run when they sent the notice to return. So in other words, there is no problem with the workability or the timetable in this contract on the appellant's interpretation of return. Except it's guesswork. I mean, I mean, you're right that if they want to play ultra safe, they do exactly what you suggested. But they're not doing it as a matter of obligation, I think you would say. They're doing it just just, just to be safe. And as my lord uh, put in his column during, during his submissions, it does, it does expose the possibility, at least, that they are either shortening or possibly lengthening their, their actual contractual entitlement raises the possibility that they may be depriving themselves of three days that they otherwise yeah. might have. If, to take the, the current case, on the appellant's interpretation of the relevant clause, the cure notice period, the 15 business days, started when they received the notice, or rather could have started, I should say, when they received the notice on the Wednesday morning LA time. Uh, in fact, as it happened, it didn't start until Friday evening, LA time, which is when the materials were consigned to uh, FedEx to be sent off. Mm. But the contract is perfectly workable because if, if, if EFB wished to ensure that they were that they had carried out any cures they wanted to within the relevant period, they could work on the basis that the period might have started on the Wednesday morning rather than the Friday evening. If, however, it subsequently transpired, it started later, and there was an argument about whether EFB had responded in time, they'd have more time in hand. But it's all back to front, isn't it? Because if you follow this through, what you're suggesting is that having made this prudent assumption, which they're not contractually obliged to make, they should then interrogate the master because they haven't got anything else, which may be a, a completely fruitless exercise because the master may be perfect and the um, lotus delivery materials have gone wonky, if at all, in compilation. Well, that takes us into the second issue surrounding this, which is the question of whether and to, the, and to what extent it would be necessary to have the delivery materials back in order to carry out any cures. And Do you accept that it's the contractual purpose? Not necessarily, my lord, no, because it what, depends. In that case, would you, if only for my benefit, explain what those words mean? In order, because at the moment I'm, I'm troubled <coughs> by in order to allow EFB or the guarantor to cure the defects in such lotus delivery materials as appropriate. Yes, the key part of that, my lord, is as appropriate, which is well, to say it, it may it's not, not be appropriate necessary. if there's nothing wrong with them. But what more does it mean? Well, it may mean that they don't need the delivery materials to carry out the relevant cures in relation to the particular defects, and that is because, as I said, there may be a range of defects. Some may be unjustified, unfounded allegations of defects which require no action. Some may be uh, defects uh, in the master which again don't necessarily require the delivery material. It may be possible to look at the master. For example, some of the script is missing. It may be obvious that, that is the sort of matter that's got nothing to do with compilation. 
that will require additional footage either to be taken off the master or sourced from somewhere in order to fill the relevant gap. So as an example, of part of an eclipse missing. Some of it, though, may, may be, as has been discussed, possibly in the compilation process, in which case a defect in the delivery materials themselves. Uh, all we are saying is that there's a range of possible defects, some of which may require the delivery materials to be returned, and some of which may not, and some of which it would be helpful to have them to be returned, but not necessarily vital. And uh, in that context, one other point to note is that the parties actually contemplated that it might not be necessary to have the delivery materials returned at all. And we can see that from clause 6.1 and also from clause uh, 5.2, which is if one looks at the passage we've been concentrating at at the bottom of 5.2, Uh, picking up, have been physically about five lines up, have been physically delivered to the state agent, the sales agent within three days after the sales agent's receipt of the producer's or EFB's or guarantor's written request. Which request the producer or EFB or guarantor shall make, if at all, within five business days? So the uh, EFB does not have an obligation, nor is it in, in contemplated by the party, it would be necessary for EFB to ask for materials to be returned. And one also sees that in clause 6.1. But how does that impact the interpretation of the clause which we're concerned with, which is predicated on there having been a request and a stated need to have them back? Well, um, my lord, can I just follow this point through, then I will answer. I'm sorry, I interrupted you halfway through. No, not, not, not at all, my lord. I'll just, I'll just complete this, um, this point, then I'll come back to that. In clause 6.1, again, um, at the, the period, the time period in the passage which has been referred to, in any, but in any event, no later than 15 business days after the later of one receiving the additional objection notice or the second response is applicable, or return of the notice delivery materials as appropriate requested by EFB or the guarantor. So the cure period the parties contemplated could start to run from the date of the receipt of the additional objection notice or the additional, the further information, the response, if uh, the uh, EFB did not request to return the materials. It's therefore clear the parties did contemplate that there could be defects in the delivery materials that did not require the return of the delivery materials, or indeed even that the return of the delivery materials wasn't necessarily helpful. I don't understand. I'm yes. very sorry. I'm very one sorry. I, I, th I think I've understood most yeah. of what you've said yeah. today, and any failure has been mine. But on this one, we're not concerned with the question. Simply doesn't arise until a request has been made. No. So how can it how can it be relevant that there may be circumstances where a request is not made? It's relevant because it shows that the the argument that is being put forward that you would always always need the delivery materials back in order to remedy any defect, because without them you can't do it, or usually can't do it, is not correct. Because the parties clearly contemplated that there might be defects uh, that have been raised in the additional objection notice that would not require even a request to return the material. That's the point I'm making. But with yeah. respect, this is all a little bit of a sideshow, because uh, um, as my lord, uh, as uh, Sir Nicholas Patton pointed out, um, where there has been a request, one has to uh, work on the basis that the contract is covering all eventualities, including circumstances in which it is necessary to have the materials in order to um, put the, de the defects right, and you accept that. Of course. So this does, doesn't help us, does it, really? Uh, well, my lady, I'm answering the suggestion Absolutely. that the parties contemplated that it would inevitably be necessary to have the delivery materials back in order, because that was the my learned friend put it, that was yeah. the way the contract worked, or words to that effect. But this is all a point little bit of a slideshow. That's, that's, that's not in fact the case. The contract contemplates that the delivery materials could be cured without them ever being sent back, depending on the nature of the defects that have been asserted. And therefore, it's, it's not the case that one needs physically the delivery materials to transfer backwards and forwards to be worked on in order to be cured. Clearly, the parties contemplated that cure could take place without any request for, for re-delivery or for return, the case may be. 
But that's the, the point I'm making, that it's not the case that this was a, a necessary process, that one should shuttle the delivery materials backwards and forwards. The process could continue without them, depending on the nature of the defect or the alleged defect. Uh, next, uh, I learned, learned a few points uh, based on possibility, for example, that without a contractual uh, requirement as to mode of delivery uh, or mode of return, Lotus could, for example, send the materials back by paddle steamer, if paddle steamer was available. Um, one assumes that, that it isn't. Uh, what we say about that is that in deciding what reasonable commercial parties may have intended by the words they use, one has regard to what reasonable possibilities might, uh, might have occurred. And therefore, it's not a, a safe method of reasoning to argue that various outlandish possibilities could cause the flaws to be unworkable in some way or another. Clearly, the parties contemplated they would be using normal methods in the industry for the delivery or redelivery or transfer of materials, having in mind the general timetable that was specified in the schedule. That sounds a bit like Miss John's implied term. Uh, it isn't the implied term, my lord. It's uh, an example of the reasonable, what the parties may be reasonably taken to have known at the time they entered into the contract. It's a different uh, mode of analysis. It's not an implied term. Because, as you will have noted, we haven't contended for any implied terms in this I appeal. Have. And the same point goes in relation, similar point in relation to the learned friend's suggestion that it may be hard to tell on our interpretation when the sending process starts. For example, if it's given to a businessman to take and he goes by Paris for a business trip, when do you say that the process of return starts? Well, uh, we accept that if the word, for example, the word send had been used, similar uh, questions could have arisen. When does the sending process start? But it doesn't follow that conceptually there's any wrong, anything wrong with return meaning send in this concept. It simply is that in many contractual situations, one can posit situations that might lead to debate about the precise moment in time. It's also relevant to note in this context that this is concerned with days, not hours. And therefore, as long as you can determine with reasonable certainty when the process of sending started to within a day, it will have no effect on the ultimate uh, timetable. So for example, you don't need to decide whether uh, the executive uh, starts the process of, uh, of sending the goods back to London when he walks down to the taxi, gets into the taxi, or goes to the airport. Because generally speaking, one doesn't need precision to within minutes. It's not that type of high frequency trading contract where that type of precision is required. Uh, one last short point is in relation to the notice of charge. Not the biggest point in the case, but it's at tab 17B, page 314. Um, I showed you clause 3.4, which refers to the senior secured party's ability to create an additional DCP. And my own friend said, well, the senior secured party is Larkhark, so that doesn't help us, the guarantors. Uh, it's also relevant, therefore, to note clause 3.1, which I probably should also have showed you. That's on page 315. There's an irrevocable authorization to permit the guarantor access to materials to effect completion and delivery of the film, including without limitation, the purpose of inspecting, cutting, scoring, and to direct the making of any prints and duplicating material as may be required fulfill the delivery requirements of the film. And so uh, the guarantors also under this had access to the masters as and when required, as one would expect to make any copies or additions or duplicates if needed. Those are my submission. I can assist you further. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Howe. Uh, and uh, thank, you, thank you to both of you for your very clear and helpful submissions. Um, we will reserve our judgments. Um, as you appreciate and are very well aware, drafts will be circulated in the usual way. Um, you'll have an opportunity to correct typographical errors, uh, not to re-argue the case, um, or to correct our grammar. And uh, 
Um, of course, you will also appreciate that uh, you don't have to attend at a hand down, but you must do your best to agree consequential issues and the order, and that if you can't agree, uh, then you will have to um, make submissions in writing about those consequential orders, and none of those matters come as any surprise to anyone. Thank you very much indeed. Got it.